And next up is Graham Bishop. Uh, Graham is a research fellow at the Global Policy Institute and a member of the European Movement's UK Executive Committee. He was appointed by President Barroso uh, to the European Commission's expert group and works as a consultant on European political, financial, economic and budgetary integration. Please welcome Graham Bishop. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to take a very different approach uh, as we're at a think tank. I'm going to be uh, a, bit, a bit provocative about some of the thoughts here. Um, the first, first question, of course, is should supporters of free markets support Britain's continuing membership of the EU? My answer is straightforward, yes. Um, <clears throat> and in the next two minutes, I'm going to support that by going through some of the facts which I see. Um, four aspects, the freedom for commerce provided by the single market uh, or in treaty speak, the internal market, international trade, and that's free trade versus the single market, then fair competition versus state aid, and finally some comments on consumer protection. So the first one, the freedoms of the single market. What are the goals? What, what are we trying to achieve? Um, and now the Treaty on the Function of the European Union, TFEU, I'm sure everyone here knows, Article 4, shared competences between the Union and the Member States applies to a, the internal market, or F, consumer protection, which I'm going to deal with at the end. Um, Article 26 then says, the Union shall adopt measures with the aim of establishing or ensuring the functioning of the internal market, and that shall comprise an area without internal frontiers, uh, in which the free movement of goods, persons, services, and capital is ensured. And everyone here will know about the famous four freedoms, and that's what it's about. Then you go on to the right of establishment in Article 49, uh, nationals uh, in a foreign place establishing their own business and so on. So my conclusion is that the, um, the single market is entirely based on the concept of free markets. That's what it says on the can. Now, second um, point, international trade, free trade versus the single market. Uh, let me quote, the natural advantages that one country has over another in producing particular commodities are sometimes so great that it is acknowledged by all the world to be in vain to struggle against this. Adam Smith, the wealth of nations, uh, and one could say Tata today, as it were, unfortunately. Um, now, the, how is the EU responding to that? And again, the preamble, desiring to contribute by means of a common commercial policy to the progressive abolition of restrictions on international trade. Now, a bit of background. Uh, 1955, six states met uh, in Messina and set the goals of a European common market free of internal duties and all quantitative restrictions. Uh, that's a classic definition of Adam, uh, free trade and I have no doubt that Adam Smith would have approved enormously. Two years later, they signed the Treaty of Rome. In 1965, they declared victory with the lifting of all customs duties. But still, trade did not flow freely. And that's when people began to realize that tariff-free trade was not enough. That's the critical thing. So steadily, the hard truth dawned them that the non-tariff barriers were the real obstacles. Uh, the technical standards that protect public health and all that sort of stuff, and Project Paragon, I hope, will remove some of them. Changes then could only be agreed unanimously. So there were no changes. Just paralysis. Who is it who is going to permit and agree to the wretched foreign competitors stealing their markets. Of course, none of them did. So, two years later, uh, two decades sorry, later, 1985, a great British Prime Minister stepped onto the stage, and Mrs. Thatcher pushed through the single European Act and introduced qualified majority voting, QMV, for trade matters, which is what we're interested in here. That was required a two-thirds majority rather than a simple majority to do it, but got rid of the unanimity. And that was the treaty which laid down very explicitly the four freedoms I mentioned. It set out a bold vision, and it attached a date, the 1992 uh, vision, the 1992 single market. But that market was designed to be a two-way street. And this is a critical thing which we have to think about. Um, I recognize your standards for, say, cheese, <coughs> so you can import your cheese into my country. But the other way around, you must recognize my standards so that my cheese could be imported into your country. And it didn't take long before everyone realized that there had to be a minimum harmonization of these standards. 
Otherwise, there was not going to be no trade, no single market. Hence the 300 pieces of post nation, some of which were referred to. Uh, now, the point for us now is if a country has different standards to those of the single market, you are not entitled to send your goods or services into that country, full stop. So when we're talking about, this is the doctrine of equivalence for financial services, and many of you are financial people here, this is so crucial today, equivalence. I could go on about this for a long time, but I won't do so this evening. Now, I set out some laudable goals. Have they been achieved in practice? And sadly, the answer, of course, is no. Much has been achieved in the last three decades, but the beneficiaries of protectionism are as tenacious as you would expect them to be. And in a world of real politics, the single market is not going to be complete in the next decade, and perhaps not even in the decade after. But it's only the collective political will to create a truly competitive single market that will make it happen. If that political will goes, the single market goes, and a lot does. And that's why we must remain in to make quite sure that we reinforce that drive to complete the single market with its commitments to free markets, with some caveats which I'll come to in a moment. So my third point then is fair competition versus state aid. And again a quote. People of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion, as this evening, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public with some contrivance to raise prices. Now, I think everyone will recognize Adam Smith again, the Wealth of Nations. So how does Europe seek to deal with Smith's observations on what's basic human nature? Um, preamble. Recognizing that the removal of existing obstacles calls for concerted action in order to guarantee steady expansion, balanced trade, and fair competition. <clears throat> now, fair competition, defined in Article 101, the following shall be prohibited. It's incompatible with the internal market. All agreements between undertakings, decisions by associations of undertakings, concerted practices which may affect trade between member states, which have as their object or effect the prevention, restriction, or distortion of competition within the single market. That is what EU competition policy is about. And one of the biggest distortions or obstacles is state aid. Uh, and that's where an economic enterprise has been decided by the market, so it's not economic, it's uneconomic. And again, let's talk about Tata. Uh, I can't talk about tax privileges, so I'll just focus on state aid for a moment. Any aid granted by a member state or through the state's resources in any form whatsoever which distorts or threatens to distort competition by favoring certain undertakings or the production of certain goods shall be incompatible with the internal market. Again, a very firm reaffirmation of the concepts of Adam Smith. But 240 years on from the wealth of nations, the UK continues to battle with these same problems that Smith identified, day in and day out, the Competition Commission, with all the things that it does. So there's no reason to think that the European Union will suddenly, mysteriously, um, comprehensively be successful in fighting vested interests. They always go on. It's the price of eternal vigilance. And leaving the EU will not change that one iota. So my last point um, is on consumer protection. And in the 90s and the early noughties, the concept of the market rules was, mm -hmm. was the accepted wisdom throughout the EU. The capitalist impulse was sweeping away the old statist ideas of national champions uh, to the enormous benefit of Europe. Um, but it turned out that too many of the leading players had a moral compass that pointed solely to the lining of their own pockets at the expense of customers, taxpayers, and societies. The cost to Europe of this um, ethical failure was massive. The Commission has calculated the state aid to banks hit 1.5 trillion euros. Total funding at the peak was 4.5 trillion euros, 50% of GDP. For the euro area, GDP fell 6% from peak to bottom, Unemployment from 7 to 12 percent, as 8 million people, 8 million people lost their jobs. Public debt ratios went from 60 percent up to 94, and uh, hopefully that's the peak. Uh, but now we're left with a legacy of very fragile public finance for decades to come. Uh, the old rule about world trade growing faster than GDP was shattered, and so there's a heavy price that's being paid by the third world, even though it's somewhat disguised. 
So unfettered markets produced a rather bad outcome. And when you look at the 2013 Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards, Changing Banking for Good, uh, they flayed the bankers in terms which should make everyone here very uncomfortable about the standards which operated in the markets uh, just a few years ago here. There was a good reason for Parliament's ire. A few years ago, we had the government's failure of equitable life, and you will remember. Founded in 1762, not a newcomer, had 800,000 customers, and they lost one and a half billion pounds collectively. Many of them, that was their life pension. Subsequent governance reforms didn't stop the CEO of RBS running circles around his board. Public capital injection, 40 billion, half the employees have lost their jobs. Then there's Leiden, then there's the FX ring. Pensions are selling. Two million people lost money, cost eight billion to put it right. And then, just at the end of my list here, the big one, 20 million PPI bonuses, and the compensation total may yet hit 40 billion pounds, 2% of GDP. This is a stunning ethical failure by the free markets in the UK. Now, we talk of banking union, and now capital markets union, which is hugely to the benefit of the city of London. Make no mistake, massive benefit to the city. But standing over this is what I call a consumer union. If citizens don't feel safe and comfortable in buying these securities, they won't. Citizens have to feel they are protected against the theft of their assets and uh, excessive or opaque charges by asset managers and securities dealers. Final minute, please. Yeah. It's quite unrealistic to think that individual consumers can look after themselves when fighting against the proven mendacity or incompetence, and sometimes both, of giant financial institutions or car manufacturers who deceive their own governments <coughs> on the emissions, etc. So the operation of free markets, the Adam Smith concept, the operation of free markets must be constrained by the minimum ne necessary of rules to protect consumers. And that's the rub. And that's the rub the EU is trying to balance, we're all trying to balance. On the left, people are going to argue for more rules, and on the right, they'll demand fewer. But in the end, the market is going to decide. If the citizens don't trust the supplier, financial services or cars, whatever it may be, they won't buy the goods or the services. And then we will all suffer from the results of lower economic activity. So, remaining in the EU maximizes our chances of arguing for the optimum balance of these rules that will encourage maximum economic growth in an area of 500 million people neighboring us where they will be completely open to our enterprises. So I beg you to urge to, uh, to vote yes to the question.